Hey, welcome to The Current Crew. This is Dr. Tom Curran. Today, we have our second part of a program on gratefulness, the virtue of gratitude. And in particular, Kerry and I are going to focus in on ways to express gratitude and service through good manners. It's a fun conversation. We know you're going to enjoy it very much. Welcome to The Current Crew. It is a very special day, Carrie. Hey, Tom. Oh, it's very special. Happy birthday Oh, thank to you, you so much. I appreciate that. No singing aloud. <laughs> uh, it's all about gratitude, so I'm grateful today for the gift of my own life and for the gift of you in my life, Carrie. But it is also the second part of a program where we started yesterday to unfold this virtue of gratitude. And so in order to get started well on my birthday, I think the most appropriate thing to do would be to begin with prayer. So let's get started. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Holy Spirit, Spirit. amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, good and gracious God, I praise you and I thank you for the gift of our lives, for all of our lives. And Lord, I pray that each of us on our birthday would be filled in a special way with the sense of gratitude for the gift of our lives. Father, you have given us so much. And today I thank you for the gift of your son, Jesus, who poured out his life so that we could come to life as your sons and daughters. May we know that life today in a new way. We make this prayer, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Carrie, lots to cover today on the program. Yeah, we just wanted to summarize what we did yesterday. And so during the month of November, we're doing the virtue of gratitude. Yesterday in the program, we talked about six ways you can teach gratitude. It was get them excited about giving, model that that um, gratitude, create a thankfulness kind of routine in the home where every day you find time to say what you're thankful for, Um, creative deprivation, let them struggle with things that they don't appreciate because uh, when you don't have something in front of you that you take it for granted. And then some way in which you can make volunteering as a family a a ritual in reaching out to the poor, those really in need, making that personal connection, and good manners. And so today we really thought that good manners could have its own program because there's so many ways in which uh, we want to teach good manners. But when do you find the time? How do you make it like a lesson? How do you actually reinforce it? Which manners do you focus on when? Because there are so many. There's when you go out in public. There's those manners in the home every day, the the manners at the dinner table, um, just so many ways in which manners impact our daily life. So we're going to just focus on today those 25 manners that kids most commonly forget. (laughs) <laughs> Only 25? Yeah, well. Well, and it's it's interesting because we come from families where manners were part of what it is we were going to be, uh, like part of what we learn, part of what we uh, cover in our own uh, in our own parenting of kids, I think in part comes from how we were brought up. Yeah, I mean, I, I was reflecting on this, Tom, and um, there are two friends that we have, one's my sister-in-law, who are so good about manners. And they always it always strikes me when I see them as they're leaving our house and they'll say goodbye to Mrs. Curran, say goodbye to Mr. Curran, or say goodbye to Auntie uh, Carrie, Auntie Uncle Tom, tell them that you're thankful. And so they're always doing this. And one is from New York, my friend Sarah. And if you find yourself on the East Coast, it is more formal and manners are very valued. They're highly... Um, um, sought after, not sought after. They're just highly. There's, there's a simple uh, expectation. Yes, and it is associated with culture. Or how cultured are you as a person? And then my sister Angelica is from Mexico, and in that culture, I imagine in the ways in which she grows up, where she grew up, you were definitely taught manners. And she's also a rule follower. So <laughs> I think manners and rule following goes hand in hand. Those people who really like to follow rules. And see this as an appropriate way to um, teach respect and responsibility for your kids. Well, Carrie, you're bringing up a, a wonderful example of how so many manners occur in our home. And that's going to show up when we go outside our home. And so the idea of learning manners at home is really going to be uh, something that can happen, not just in the course of ordinary days, but sometimes gets brought out in on special days like today. <laughs> Happy birthday, Tom. Oh, thank you. Dear, dear, dear. Oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. But I, I love what you do for birthdays. And uh, it's, a, it's a way that we ritualize. Yeah, we ritualize not just the idea of celebrating somebody, but celebrating someone in association with manners. Well, and I think what 
this what has come about through the years of celebrating birthdays in our home is the spirit of gratitude and celebration and appreciation. It really is a way to serve and honor that person whose birthday it is. And we do little things to make that person feel special. And I know all homes do something of some kind to create a birthday atmosphere. Now, in our home, it's really simple, and we've gotten it pretty streamlined. But we actually have a birthday box or a birthday bin in our pantry, and in it is birthday banners. We have one for boys, one for girls, and sometimes we have to replace them. And we have birthday streamers and balloons. And we ha- I have two kids that like to celebrate holidays. That is their thing. And I pull that birthday bin out, and within 20 minutes, they have the whole dining room Uh, redecorated for the person's birthday. So like for you, Tom, we had the streamers up, a couple of balloons, and then we get, I buy the really cute napkins and the really cute paper plates from Trader uh, TJ Maxx. That's where I go into the aisle, and I love to find little cute things that I think would be suited for that child. And I usually buy them weeks, months in advance. And we just have a bin of, you know, take, is it a boy's birthday, girl's birthday? I mean, sometimes we go overboard and buy like a themed birthday. Like we did Frozen a few um, months back. We went to um, Seabrook. But we just pull out those really pretty colors and we match the colors and we pull out a tablecloth because we don't typically have a tablecloth on our table. And we have a couple of candles lit and maybe we'll put some flowers down. But it just is a way to say, the table is set. We are going to celebrate this person. And we may even do a birthday chair where there's some streamers and balloons. It depends on how much energy I have by that point in the evening when I'm like, oh, it's his birthday tomorrow. We haven't decorated the table. <laughs> and we're scrambling. But um, just those little ways in which you can show gratitude by how you create a home or how you create a space. And I think key to that is decluttering it and cleaning it. I mean, because you, Tom, love spaces that are clean. Amen, sister. (laughs) Counters that are emptied off. And there is this way in which it's a fresh set space for an event to occur. And I love, can I just say, I love wrapping gifts. I love wrapping paper. I love coordinating colors and designs. And so we have a, a bin of wrapping paper up in my closet. And I have a couple of kids that love to wrap. And if we can just put four or five gifts on the buffet table and set that up, it just has this overarching way of saying we're honoring this person. Do you feel loved? Do you yeah. feel honored? Oh, my gosh, yes. <laughs> does it work? It does. It works wonderfully. And, and what you've done, Carrie, is you just you talked about the concept of a celebration or an event. And that's ordinarily when we talk about like creating events in the home and all of that or a celebration – now you've taken it and you've wrapped it around the theme of gratitude that a birthday celebration can be um, centered on the concept of gratitude. We're grateful for you. Yes. Not, it's not just about celebrating you or giving you gifts, but no, we're grateful for you. Yes. And so that can be a means of understanding even something like a birthday celebration. So why do we want to uh, get the house clean in this way? Why do we want to declutter? Why do we want to set the table? Why do we want to come up with special gifts or a special meal? Like, what I would never have for breakfast these days, bacon <laughs> and eggs and, and chocolate croissants. And if you don't know the oh chocolate croissants goodness. from Trader Joe's, you have to go to their freezer section. There's four in a box, and your house will smell like a French pastry uh, store by morning. And they rise over more overnight in the oven, and it is... My kids love them. And we just do... We vary that with cinnamon rolls on birthdays with, of course, bacon or sausage, depending I'm on the... I'm trying so hard, <laughs> Carrie, to lose weight, and you're not helping well, me. I've got to run extra amounts now just to run off that that breakfast. We, see how grateful I am? See how grateful you yeah, are. Yeah, we so all this. do this. But really, when we tell our kids, like you said, Tom, when we tell our kids we're celebrating this person's birthday, we're going to share our gratitude, our gratefulness for them, and we're going to start to think about ways and things that they've done over the past year that we want to acknowledge on this day. It really does create this spirit of appreciation and affirmation. And it's not that, um, but this is just the most natural. I mean, besides Father's Day, Mother's Day, this is one of the most natural times to celebrate a person and to share your gratitude for them um, on that day. So it was perfect for our program. Thank you for (laughs) fitting us into November. It does. Well, and it's... uh, Oh, uh, St. Paul, owe to no one the, a debt except for that debt of love, the debt that, that love brings about. And St. Thomas Aquinas uses that quote under the virtue of gratitude. When he talks about that debt of love, 
that we have for a person uh, is uh, it, it's about love. It's not about debt. So it's like, oh my gosh, it's someone's birthday. We've got to now put together a party versus, no, I, I've got so much gratitude in you. There's this debt of love that I want to pay, if you will, by how we celebrate you. So it gratefulness is a wonderful driver. It, gratefulness can be a wonderful motivator for what we do and how we do it. Yeah, that's excellent. And also just with the birthday ritual, it is so great to be able to do these kinds of things with our kids. They all look forward to each other's birthdays because they all expect this this morning breakfast. Um, we do something for dinner and then lunch is not so much because we're all out and about. But we always have a birthday breakfast and we always do something special for dinner. And it's really celebrated around the food and around that person. And so tomorrow, uh, in the morning on a birthday, the kids are often up an extra half hour early just for the excitement and the sense of we're going to have a special meal and it's a special per- and just imagine if it's you that you know it's your birthday how much you are feeling loved and celebrated by your family. I think we should family. practice this some more. <laughs> I think we should have like practice honoring dad's birthdays. And, well it's just a great way yeah. to start out the day right? Yes. So and our kids all expect it now so if I forget sometimes I've gone to bed I've gotten ready for bed around 10 or 11 and I'm like oh, it's someone's birthday and I have it. I mean Literally, that has happened to me several times in the last two years. Well, Carrie, to be honest with you, I think um, there are probably a lot of wives here listening saying, my husband should be hearing this program because I'm hearing you say this and I'm feeling a little guilty because I'm not as good at this as you are in terms of your birthday or on Mother's Day to get the kids be prepping their thinking and get the gifts and get the special ele- you know, elements done for that. So... Uh, no excuses here. No ex- <laughs> This is a confession. This is a confession, not an excuse. Well, and I think you take your gift that you have and you bring it to bear. So if your husband is uh, does acts of service, you make up that beautiful honeydew list for the week of your birthday. Or if you give gifts of or words of affirmation, it's a one. I mean, Tom, that's your gift language to all of us. You are great at affirming and celebrating. That is that is how God made you, and that that gift comes to bear all the time on these events. Um, or maybe your love language is buying beautiful gifts, and those wives that have a husband like that know that. Um, so it's you are getting not necessarily better, but just you are where you need to be, and we celebrate you <laughs> for the gifts you've been given, and we are not count, you know, counting the cost, so to speak. Well, and just to acknowledge before we dive into these many, I know we have many of these manners to cover, uh, just a brief reflection on my 51st year. Like, what was that all about? This 50th year is a jubilee year. You know, it's that it's supposed to be a year of rest. It's supposed to be a year of experiencing a, a setting free. Uh, you know, all of that, that the, the, the theology of the jubilee, it's, it's really worth reflecting on some more. Just um, what was my 50th year all about? It was about your wife getting more involved in your <laughs> in your mission, in your vocation. I mean, I feel like this year has been the first year where we have actually worked side by side in ministry. And it's been an awesome thing, but it's been a really hard thing. It's really stretched us. And I don't think it's been a year of rest. I would say anything but that. I feel like I've worked, I'm working harder and longer and more um, focused than I ever have. Well, and for me, I, I was trying to strip back from work in order to focus more. And now you have and, me to... <laughs> oh my gosh, it's been... I'm like, I, I don't know how that quite worked out in the way I, I intended it to. So Carrie, going from from that, my talking about, or us talking about uh, the sort of Jubilee year and, and worth reflecting on more, we'll do that later. The The idea of birthdays, you know, I think of how we do it here. Well, a lot of what we do in our home is, is traced back to things that we learned growing up. I mentioned early on, even the concept of manners is and gratitude and expressing of gratitude, you know, in terms of appropriate responses and manners come from from our homes, you know, from our moms and dads. And I have to say, I'm so curious and questioning when I see certain people do certain manners that I see are ritualistic, like they always are saying, having their kids do this or that. And I'm watching them like, oh, that is how they were raised. That is not how I was raised. And 
I love my mom and dad, um, but my mom grew up in a very strict Irish home that was more formal. And she would tell us the stories of always having to wear the white gloves, and she could never find her white gloves, and her white gloves would get dirty. <laughs> and so and eventually, I think part of her desire to get away from that formality brought her out to um, Washington State. And she had that little rebel spirit in her. But when she met my father, he grew up on a farm. My grandpa Mike um, owned a lot of farmland down in South Park, and they, he had a lot of the Italians working for him. He was Italian, and they would bring the trucks down to the market, to the Pike Place Market. So she meets my dad in a hospital. Um, she's a nurse, and he's visiting a good friend of his who was injured in um, – some kind of like site uh, battling that they were doing. It wasn't from the war. And this was World War II. <laughs> How far back is that? Just afterwards. And um, she meets him. And so she said that the first thing she noticed was his dirty fingernails. And she's like, where was he raised? How was he raised? How does he have dirty fingernails? And I was like, mom, that's what you thought of. Well, there were other things, but she just was this very cultured Irish background. So she goes to the farm and she said, I just never seen such uh, informality and um, warmth and effusion and emotion because here's my grandpa Mike with all the farmers gathered around the kitchen and they're passing the wine around and they're having this big su- everyone talking, talking on top of each other <laughs> this, this is, is Italian loud. culture and this she's is- like this very proper and my grandma was a hundred percent German so I don't even know how my grandma and grandpa stayed together an Italian and a German <laughs> but um she just goes into this, like, can you imagine? You don't have the internet. They didn't have TV. Uh, so they really didn't see other cultures. You were kind of in your own little niche. and But she was attracted to him, and they ended up, you know, having a wonderful marriage. But you can see how those two cultures would have collided in some areas of life. Well, and it's it's kind of interesting because it's somewhat parallel to, to the way I grew up with my mom's side of the family, the Italian side being the more dominant, just because it is more effusive and more boisterous and sort of like the the party is loud and it's long. It is so loud. Well, and it's centered around. Now it's loud at our house. Well, and the interesting thing is it's like, what would be the principal rooms where the family would be expressing life? It was the kitchen and the dining room. And it was, you know, there was always food and multiple people around the kitchen and serving up more stuff. And then everyone's around the dining room table and and all the adults are telling stories and the kids are coming and going. And it's just now that that was sort of a, you know, the melting pot of life that was going on in the in in an Italian family. And we come into your house, but you had that front room. That was very formal, and you had like the nice couches and the nice furniture, yeah. and we would mm-hmm. never go in there for the first, I don't know, five years of our marriage until your parents re, you know, I think they reworked their house. But how many houses in the olden days had that very formal room? Yeah, and those dead. are really yeah. disappearing from homes today. Now they're just opening up, taking down walls where it's a more of an open space, an open concept. Yeah. And, and I don't know if I'm using the correct words, but the living room is more the one where all the living happens versus more of a den, which is a bit more formal, where people can sit and visit. And that was definitely more my dad's side. I, I remember going to my Grammy, my dad's mom's uh, home, and sitting there, uh, in uh, sitting on the couch that had the plastic on it, and my dad and mom were talking <laughs> to my grandma and her sister. And there they were, just talking, and, and the expectation was kids are to be seen but not heard, and kids were to be sitting and and that was the the proper thing you you speak if you're spoken to, and that's I'm, I'm exaggerating a oh, bit. That'd be so nice. I think of all the times I have my friends over, and I'm like, kids, go away, just go away. I haven't had an adult conversation in three days, yeah. and I'm just I almost get like kind of mean. I don't mean to, but they're you know constantly coming. I say, just all of you go in the back room or take your shoes and put them on, go outside, because it is nice when adults can have that time and that space. Right. And so here's the thing: even though there was a, a different a distance or a difference between my da- uh, my dad's side and my mom's side when it came to formalities, there was a definite commonality when it came to manners. There were many things that would definitely be shared as 
common expectations about what a polite young man or woman that properly formed and educated as a young man or a young woman would be expected to do. Well, and your mom is very well mannered, and I think that's something she really values and she really upholds. And she um, is so great at writing the thank you cards and sending out the cards. And I, I think she's even given us a couple of books on etiquette. I think she was trying to send me some <laughs> like subtle messages. You need to read up, Carrie. <laughs> Not at all. That's funny. No, she. I, I, I don't even remember how she stumbled into a copy of the book. Book, but she was so she found it so interesting that she sent it out to me and I got my own copy or she told me the title and I got my own copy one way or the other but it was a fascinating book of etiquette and I think I actually did a radio program on it a couple of years ago just like cherry picking out fascinating things about etiquette that were from I think like the early 1900s and just the, or maybe it was maybe 50 years ago it was very detailed very detailed and things you uh, never would have thought of well I think accountants and people that write etiquette books have a lot in common. They like specific detailed actions that you follow. And that would just, that is not me. I'm like much well, more. <laughs> okay. But Carrie, even adults, we face this. Think of like formal dinners that you go to, maybe at a wedding or something. How many times are you at a special dinner and you're like, okay, which fork do I use and what direction does the food go in and what about the napkin and do you talk to people that are across the table from you and if you're just meeting someone do you actually shake hands do you what do you reach and yes uh, there, and how know, many conversations should you, you have and where right. should you seat people how exactly do you put your yeah. silverware how do you cut meat right there's the European form or the continental I think it's called continental cut and it's just like so many things that everyone's kind of looking. Thinking, Am I doing this right? Am I doing? I and I say that I did a uh, we I, one of the things that I do is is I work with a team and we teach uh, executives how to present. And part of the program they go through involves dinner etiquette, etiquette at like uh, high, at formal events. And I can remember going through it and asking a ton of questions. <laughs> Because I'm like, you know, I, I had some things right, but I'm not afraid to learn. And it's like, wow, boy, there were some refinements that I needed to make regarding, uh, you know, formal meals. Yeah. Well, and I think if you're from the West Coast where you were working with Boeing, where they're located, I feel like um, it's very informal in the Northwest and in the on the West Coast compared to the East Coast. And the Northeast is extremely formal. And then you have the South, where they're very um, polite and kids are, how they treat adults and that whole level of respect is really held. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. That's right. <laughs> and so it really depends partly on where you come from as to the, the degree, but there are just basic etiquette things and for, uh, manner things that all of us should be doing. Well, and I think of up here in the Northwest, there are a, a lot of military families. And I've, when I am, there are times when I'm you know, interacting with someone and say, yes, sir. And I'm like, oh, that's a military person because I'm not that old. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like there is something that's pretty striking about when you hear say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. And, and they're doing it very naturally. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That there is a, uh, I don't know, it's attractive. Yeah. There's something for me, it, it's attractive. Yeah. Maybe it's because I'm from Boston. Well, and I think it gives a sense of um, respect and politeness and um, humbling, you know, the scripture where it says, humble yourselves, put others before you. Um, we were looking at, was it Col uh, Col Philippians 2? Two. 2, yeah, 2 3. And we were just talking about the scripture that we want to reach out and, and share with our kids. And um, there is something where you're humbled before another person and you sense that sense of um, love and kind respect. I don't know, respect is one word, but it even goes to the point reverence. of love and re well, reverence is a better word. So. Anyhow, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yes, ma well, <laughs> ma'am, let's that. move forward. I I'm excited to get into some of these. Okay, we're uh, not going to do all 25. We'll just do the ones that touch us and that we think are relevant. So let's start with uh, this one, Tom. Do you want me to read it? Yeah, please. Since okay. Ma'am, I don't have my, ma I put oh, my glasses, glasses on. I I'll put them on. <laughs> hey, when people ask you how you are, tell them and then ask them how they are. And again, this is for kids. That uh, when we want to train them to show manners in public, uh, the read that one one more time. When people ask you how you are, tell them, and then ask them how they are. And do you know what your notes say there? Can we put your glasses Sorry. on? It My says, notes be say, positive, be brief. Be positive and be brief. <laughs> yes. Well, 
have you ever been in a situation where you say, oh, hi, how are you? And then they begin to tell oh, you a story. Oh, well, I got my flat tire. That goes and on and happened, on and, and on and on. And then that happened. And- or they'll say something that is like an invitation to ask further. Like, well, actually, things aren't going so well right now. And then you're like, well, uh, what happened? And then all of a sudden you've given them permission to just go off into a very, very long story. Yeah. And so for our kids... Uh, if if you're going to be asked, how are you? Well, tell them, unless you're not doing well, then don't tell them. <laughs> just say, I'm doing fine, thank I just you. had the 24-hour flu and I threw up, but you know, my mom said <laughs> I could come out. And <laughs> Well, no, the reality is what? That, that there's a, that's part of being polite. Part of being polite is when you introduce yourself to someone or you're being introduced to someone that it's a natural thing to say, hi, how are you? Okay, the first time I met your friend from New Jersey, John, and his family, I just thought, I didn't know people from New Jersey were like this, but hi, how you doing? How you no, doing? Nice no, to meet you. No, okay. How'd you doing? How are you? How are you? How's the family? <laughs> I thought Come it was on. the most goofy thing because it just seemed so, like, the formality of it all was, see, I'm from the West Coast and the Northwest, we want to be real and authentic. We value this sense of being true. And so when they say, how are you doing? I'm like, oh, no, I'm okay. How are you doing? How are you? <laughs> How's the family? But I, I heard this asked over and over in That's the matter right. of 20 minutes. Like, why do they all say this? It's just so, in, because no one was really telling how they were doing. They were just kind of checking the box no, of formality. That is, <laughs> that's the way, uh, enter the conversation when you meet someone. That's what being polite was. That was what oh, good manners See, I didn't is. grow up with good manners, I guess. No, but, no, that's New Jersey good manners. Okay, where you're from. So anyhow, have your kids, um, just so they know to say, how are you doing, Mrs. So-and-so? How are you doing, Mr. So-and-so? I'm doing fine. Thank you for asking. How are you? So, And I think that that's really um, important. And I know my friend Sarah always, I know her kids do this. She does this. Oh, okay, she's from New York. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. a very East Coast thing, but it's important. Okay, next one. And it one. needs to be taught. And it needs to be right? taught. And that's one of those things where just don't expect kids that are through osmosis are somehow going to learn that when they meet someone, that they are to look them in the eye, put their hand out, shake their hand. This is how you shake a hand. This is how you address that person, and you talk with them. And, you know, when you say, hi, how are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you. How are you? Yes. And we can cut. We're going to cover. I mean, these are some here. We're also going to cover those about that manners for the dinner table and also manners when you go to someone else's home. And because it's really important that you actually teach it in a setting where... And practice it. And you practice it and you bring in, okay, we're working on these five today. You can't just teach them 25 manners. But it's a conversation you could have around the dinner table if your dinner table is less loud than our dinner table. <laughs> That's that Italian thing showing up. <laughs> um, but it is, so, you know, pick and choose a few of these that you think, oh, that'd be great. And you can Google this on um, the internet all sorts of lists of manners to help with, you know, to teach your kids. Okay. When you make a phone call, introduce yourself first and then ask if you can speak with the person you are calling. Right. And I heard that one and I, or I read that one. I thought, oh, introduce yourself first and then ask, is this a good time to talk? Is this, a, is this an okay time uh, to, to call? It's that asking permission. And I find that people aren't accustomed to hearing that. And it does make a, an, an important impression because you're saying, I respect the fact that um, I might not be calling you at the best time. And if it's not a good time, then I'm, I'm happy to, to call it at a good time. And I think this really has to be taught because of us, smartphones and all the texting that happens. When we do a party or a gathering at our house, I will send out a text to six moms and just say, hey, this is Carrie. We're having a gathering, da, 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 da. And a lot of them will text back. Well, then I really don't have a lot of extra, extra time to call and talk to moms. Um, and so if I can delegate that to my kids and it's their party and it's with their friends, I'll say, here, you need to contact these two moms. They've not contacted me yet. I don't know if they're coming. Do they know about it? I'm not sure if they got the text. And so it's really important that when some of our kids will like, I don't want to talk on the phone. Like they don't really know how to talk on the phone. I'm like, what? What do you mean don't want to talk? On the phone? I just don't feel comfortable talking on the phone. Like that's all far removed they are from a phone and Or maybe you're talking to adults. It can, be a, bit, to it can adults. be a bit intimidating. And so this is part of what we have to teach our kids. Yeah. So when we, they do call, say, this is Ariana. I don't know if this is a good time or not, but I'm just calling about the, we sent a message. Did you get it? And I do get back from some families. Oh, she called. She's so polite. I was like, oh, good. I'm glad it was Ariana that called, <laughs> makes those calls. She's great at following rules and being mismanners. So Carrie, I like that tip. 
and there are many more tips that we're going to cover today on the program. So let's dive in. What's the, what's the third one? Okay, this is another one. Never use foul language. I, I said vulgar in front of adults. Grown-ups already know all those words, and they find them boring and unpleasant. I don't even know if they'd find them boring. Mm-hmm. Yeah, boring and unpleasant. I, Aren't the words I would say. Yeah, I would have said maybe a bit shocking if they're younger kids in using them. And I would find it rude or yeah. just um, almost... Rude and unattractive. Yeah. Like they put down boring and unpleasant. <laughs> These I are said, very formal words. I said... <laughs> These are manner words. <laughs> I said boorish and unattractive. <laughs> yes. That if you're like, if you're using that language... Uh, what a bore you are. You know? Yeah, when we and they say foul language, it's like I would never allow my kids to use words like that's so stupid or, oh, I hate, you know, those kind of words. They're not, quote unquote, these swear words, but they're certainly vulgar. And when our kids use those in the home, I'm like, don't talk that way. What, mom? It's not a, I said, no, it's vulgar. It shows that you don't have a sense of what's appropriate and right. And <laughs> I try. <laughs> it's just not respectful. That's not how we talk in our home. And I have to fight my kids on this, meaning I have a couple couple of kids that just say the same kind of words over and over, and I have to call them on it continuously. And if it's an issue, then I start taking um, time away from them in the evening for them to watch a show. I'm like, you just lost 10 minutes of that show. That's the third time I've heard you say idiot or whatever that word is. And there's some consequence in place because... I feel like as a mom, if I just keep saying, don't say this word, don't say that, you shouldn't say that, it really doesn't sink in unless there's a consequence that's negative that really hurts something they want. And then I see that behavior change. But if you don't back it up with a consequence, that's appropriate. I mean, I'm not going to say, go to your room for five hours. You just said idiot. (laughs) You know, it's not like that. It's like that warning and we just don't talk that way. And it's, you're talking about language again. So good manners involves using a good choice of language. So there's a difference between swearing and then words that are just like uh, negative. Yes. Uh, so you use vulgar. So you use the word idiot, right? That's not a swear, but why use that word? Mm-hmm. Well, why would you need to use that word? You can say, boy, that, boy, you're really not, you know, you don't have to use that word. You can say, I don't, I don't like what you did or I don't like what you said. Or if you're going to use another word um, like hate, uh, we, we say don't use that word hate. And so now the say, kids I say, I find that annoying. I find yeah, that bothersome. I, I don't. I don't like that at all. <laughs> Is that what you tell them? Does that yeah. work? Well, they say <laughs> I, it kind of loses its punch. I don't like that. At all. Well, I think that what they were using back is uh, I, I severely dislike that or because I gave them another way of using it. And they, they did that. They went after that. Well, so. and it's not just the word they use. It's the tone. That is so annoying. Right, you know, when right. they use this kind of whiny, high pitched tone of, you know, that also can be considered uh, unpleasant or boorish. And another common thing I hear one of our kids say is nobody cares. And I say, when you say that, do you know what you're saying? Nobody cares. You're saying nobody loves you. Nobody has care or love for you as a person, as a person of dignity. And I, and then I say to her, where did you hear that word? Because this is not how we talk in our home. A lot of times kids will bring home common things, that, uh, words they hear or phrases they hear from school or from a soccer, you know, a team that they play on. And they bring it into the home and they, they want to try it out. And immediately you hear, you hear that snap. <laughs> Immediately, you call them on that, and you say, "This is not how we talk in our home. This is, these are not words we use." And then they'll say, "But mom, you say words that are not appropriate." And then you have to like, okay, come fast and say, "Yes, I should not say those words, and you need to hold me accountable." But when I drop something, I just can't help it but say a swear word. <laughs> Sorry, it's a true confession. Whenever I drop something, well, oh. and one I think that is even sort of not nobody cares. I don't care. Mm-hmm. And when when they respond like that, then it's like. No, wait a minute. No, that's not. And and when I asked our daughter who would say that, who would default to that kind of phrase, I don't care as a way of responding to something that she didn't like. <clears throat> mm-hmm. She'd say, well, that's how we speak to each other in school. It's a, it's a common way that we address each other. And it doesn't carry that like deeper, more dark or just painful meaning. Um, of saying, I don't care. Yeah, I don't think they really get what it means. I think they Mm -hmm. just fall into this bad habit. Like they'll say, I hate you as a joke. They think that, oh, I hate you. And they're laughing at each other. And I'm like, okay, I got that. You don't really mean those words, but words carry weight. They send forth a message. They into 
eternity. And you cannot send that ripple effect upon your friends, even if you don't take it, you know, not seriously. It's right. still not. And I always, of course, your sisters are listening. Your brothers are listening. You're setting an example. They get the whole lecture and then they're <laughs> like, oh, man, why did I ever say that word? <laughs> and then, well, what happens? And then they go from there out into public. And here they are now, our kids out in public, and they're making a much bigger impression when they're in social settings. If they're if they've had easy access and not have not been challenged around what language they're using, yeah, it's important. It's a good topic to discuss. It's something that you can discuss with your kids. I mean, this is something we deal with all the time: our words that are spoken in our home and how they talk to others. Okay, let's do one that I think this applies to mass and going to church. Even if a play or an assembly is boring, s- sit through it quietly and pretend that you are interested. The performers and presenters are doing their best. And right away, I thought of, even if you're at Mass and you find it boring, (laughs) pretend that the homily is interesting. And I noticed this just the other week. Uh, My daughter had a bracelet on, and she started fiddling with it. And then she took it off and started playing that game where you hide it under one of the hands, and the other kid was trying to figure out which one it was in. And then a couple of our girls had nail polish on, and I noticed that this was like a month ago. They started picking at their nail polish. And I wasn't sitting by them. There was like five kids between me and them, and you were on the other end. We should really be more strategic (laughs) about where we sit during Mass. And I'm telling you, at Mass, it's not my three- and five-year-old that are the most difficult right now. It is my tweens that are distracted and fiddling, and they get bored, and they start teasing or talking or and so this is just telling them you know we're during you can't tell them during mass this is why you have to have that conversation before mass or after mass it's better to be proactive and set those guidelines up ahead of time because then it doesn't come across as punishing and demeaning and blaming but it's more hey this is who we are this is how we want to be let's do this and it's has more of a positive moving forward versus this reactive of why were you picking your nails and why were you playing with you and that just doesn't help and I'm thinking that uh, you you say, you know, you have to set them up for it immediately before Mass, and that's absolutely true. And then there's the, the longer, uh, harder road of helping them to appreciate what is happening at Mass. Because yes, that's if a Mass whole is boring, yeah. that's a great sadness. And, you know, it's easy to become distracted at, at Mass. It's easy to not uh, necessarily be drawn into heavenly worship if we are not in ourselves in a good place spiritually, or if we're tired, or again, just there's so many things that you can do to help uh, diminish the the reasons why kids would become bored at Mass. Yes, absolutely, Tom. And I feel like I've started to teach them in the last two years um, more the manners um, as well as the heart. I mean, they go hand in hand. Because when I see my kids slouch, or I see kids like lean over with their head and their the palms of their hand, I'm like, sit up <laughs> or elbow them, sit up. Because mm-hmm. there's just a sense of disrespect and not attending to the homily or the readings, what happens to be going on. And it is important that we as parents expect them to behave. And a lot of times I'll see them not do this in the school masses where they're with their friends and they're in their families, but I see them do this when they're with mom and dad. And it's almost like some of the ba- the worst behaviors are exacerbated when they're with mom and dad in the family, in the home, because it's just this kind of relaxed, casual setting. And we fall into just, you know, get me this, go get me that. I need this. I need a spoon. I need you to turn on the computer well, it's without the pleasure. You can pleases. kick your shoes off. It's like you, you don't have the adults there that are um, not your mom and dad. And so, it's like, uh, you know, if you, those adults are around, well, all of a sudden now you're going to be on your best behavior or at least more aware to be at, uh, to be acting in a better way. Well, now, finally, I can just kind of let it all hang yeah, out. Yeah, I mean, the home, but, it should be that place where they feel relaxed, but that doesn't mean we don't remain as, have a sense of appreciation and put mm-hmm. others first, which is something that is transformative. It comes in that faith walk with Christ and not all that, kids. Uh, what was that TV show on uh, PBS that was about the family in England and the big old mansion thing. Downton Abbey. Oh, (laughs) yes. It should be like that in the home. (laughs) Whenever you come down to a meal together. That would be very Getting dressed for dinner and come down the stairs. (laughs) That would be my dream birthday. It's like one birthday I have a dinner like Downton Abbey where all my kids are sitting around rolling these long gowns and long necklaces. Okay, this manner really bothers me. If you bump into somebody, immediately say, excuse me. And this bothers me because I see my kids do this quite a bit. 
at home where they bump into somebody or someone gets hurt and they just walk away. And it's like, hey, did you not realize you just hurt somebody or just ran your sister over or you just, it's like, why don't you say, excuse me? Why don't you say, do you need help? So Carrie, you're saying that you see, because I saw this manner and I didn't realize that it was, oh, kids bumping into kids. Because I see that all the time in our home and I don't hear kids saying, excuse me. I was thinking though, more in public where I would imagine that our kids, you're telling me our kids when, when they're in public and they, it, it's probably a rare occasion they're bumping into somebody. No, I think that's a good distinction, Tom. I think what bothers me is when a, one of our kids bumps or hurts another child, that child goes down, that child's crying, and they kind of walk away. And there's no care, there's no concern, there's no, are you okay? Can I get an ice pack for you? Can I help you? And this is something we want to talk about in our family gathering, because it just is this dismissive of, I did anything wrong, and here another person's injured. It's like, do they not see? Can't they just pick up well, that three-year-old and, Carol, and using, hug her? You're using language that's easily misunderstood. You're talking about our kids are running around the house, and they're playing a game, and they turn a corner, and they bump the three-year-old Liliana, and she goes down, and they just keep blasting forward, not thinking, I need to stop, and I need to attend to my three-year-old. Yes. That's the kind of thing you're talking yes. about. It's not that you know they twisted their arm and they're going to the hospital. It's just, (laughs) these are the bump bumping things that happen in homes. But um, for me, one of the things that I have taken to correct my kids on is that when they do bump into um, one of the younger kids and those kids go down or end up getting bumped into something else is that their default answer is, but dad, it was an accident. Yes. I hear my response back is no, it was careless. It was careless. You had less care. You didn't have, you didn't have sufficient care. It was a, it was a lack of care. Does that work? (laughs) Do they respond? Well, what I'm saying is this, is that, look, you, uh, yeah. A lot of times they'll say that's an accident. It was an accident. It was, it was a mistake. I didn't mean to hurt. I didn't mean that she was going to get hurt. We were wrestling. We were fooling around. We were just running around and that, that happened. It was, it was like there was no active agent yes. causing that. Well, we have a child that literally hurts some three kids a day. I'm not meaning to. Not They're hurts. just having fun. Bumps into. Well, I get the tears. I get, oh, I got hurt again. Oh. And then I was like, by after dinner time, I'm like, okay, I've had three kids come to me crying. Getting bonked around. And it's like, do you say, I'm sorry, are you okay? Can I get you? Some of the injuries are yeah. more serious. Can I get you an ice pack? Just to Don't show. Don't be so careless. Care. Just to show yeah. concern and, about and that's that. And that's a sign of, of good manners. And I think that that's modeled by mom and dad. I think often I'll look and someone will get bumped and they're crying. I'm like, oh, they're all fine. I'll walk, you know, I'm not walking away. I was just never in the vicinity. But if I were to go, oh, are you okay? Do you need, you know, a hug? Let me help you up. And I mean, I mean it sincerely, but I notice the kids are watching me. They right. see how I respond. Yeah, be careful is what I say. Look, you need to be full of care. Yeah. And so if things happen like that, that's fine. But be full of care. Be careful, not careless. All right. Amen. <laughs> I, I'm t- it's like I'm talking to my kid right now, right? It's so, so funny. You're energized. All right. Here's one for the season. You'll get this one. Cover your mouth when you cough or sneeze. <coughs> I'm sorry. What was that? And do not pick your nose in public. Uh, I'm or not ever. doing that right now. <laughs> and um, I have a couple of kids. That, one of ours in particular, she just will take her hand and rub up her nose. And I'm like, oh, get a tissue. And she has her sleeve. She's like, why? I need tissue. I have a sleeve. I'm like, no. And I always carry tissues in my purse just to hand them because there's a lot of runny noses right now. There's a lot of coughing going on. So not only um, get a tissue, but cover your mouth into your elbow or turn away. And some kids just don't realize some of the noises that they're making when they're, you know, they have snuffles and, and we have to teach them and tell them and help them with that. And they're not going to learn it unless we show them and teach them. So. Yes. I think that is, uh, that is, again, it's a very practical thing. Again, it's like how many of these things are involved in just being good parents to equip our kids in the basic things of life to be able to show good manners when they're in public? Like, what do you do when you have a cold? What do you do when you have to sneeze and cough and yeah. actually work on it? That's a good point, Tom. As you walk through a door, 
Look to see if you can hold it open for someone else. And this may not be something we encounter quite a bit because a lot of it doors are electric. They automatically open. Or if you're at Costco, you just walk right in. There is no door to go through. But I notice that when we go to the public library, our kids will kind of push their way through an opening. And there's sometimes an elderly person or whenever there's a mom with a baby or whenever there's a mom with a stroller, I'm like, hold the door open for them, help them, and be mindful because our kids are in a hurry and they want to get to the next thing and they're trying to go get their book or DVD and they will just kind of blo- you know, go past an elderly person and not necessarily be rude, but there's just this rude atmosphere that comes about. It's not putting that person before themselves. It's not the sense of being humble or respectful or courteous to those who are older. Well, that is, that's an interesting one because one of the practices I do with our daughters is I hold the door open for them, the car door. So whenever I'm driving them, it really, almost without exception at all, um, if we go out to the car, I'll wait by the, the passenger side door or the back door, depending on how old they are, you know, where they're sitting. I'll wait for them to come out and then I'll open the door for them. And they're almost like they regularly will say to me, dad, you don't have to do that. Dad, come on. And they'll almost like try to write it off or just say it's not necessary. But I'll say, I won't even say anything. I'll just open the door and say, no, no, it's fine here. And I'll hold the door open for them. And some of the times they'll actually want to take the handle and close the door themselves. But I will close the door for them. And I'm wanting to convey something to them. You're a woman and you have dignity. And men should honor that. And they should respect you. And so this is a sign of the respect that I would expect you to expect from any man. That's great, Tom. I think that's really important. I think all of these manners are the ones we've talked about just recently pertain to time. It is, do you take time to hold the door open for another person? Do you take time to say you're sorry or excuse me when you bump into or hurt another person? Do you take time to, I mean, all of them require just this amount of time. And I feel in our culture today, there's a sense that there isn't enough time and we're on to the next thing. And I feel like in our house, this is a really big um, temperament of racing here, racing there because of the amount of things we're involved in. And I just feel like this is so important to say, hey, let's look at these manners. Let's talk about them in the home. And I feel like in the home, these aren't, like I think we mentioned before, they're not as easily um, uh, it's e- it's harder, it's more difficult to always say please and thank you in the home. We kind of start to take each other for granted or to not appreciate or to just demand and expect. And a lot of times, um, even when we say please and thank you, our kids will say, get me a spoon or will you get me this or can you get me that? And I'll just kind of look at them and say, what, what was that? <laughs> Did you forget something? Please, mom, will you get me a spoon? And you know, it, it really goes to, are we even aware of how we're treating each other? Yes. I think of what St. Thomas Aquinas said again when he was saying, what do you do if someone um, takes advantage of your, uh, of your gracious favor, where you do something that's beneficial to them and they, express, they don't express any gratitude? And he says the first thing to do is what? Continue to show them favor in the hopes that it'll, it'll dawn on them, wow, I'm getting these benefits. I should be grateful. And that's that's the first path out. But the second path is if they continue to take advantage of it, in other words, it's going to lead them into darkness, into evil, for them to just be simply not expressing gratitude, to be ungrateful, then you don't. You, you correct them and you address it differently. That's a good point, especially if you're modeling that in the home and you want it to catch on and it's taken a while. Um, I like this one. When an adult asks you a favor, do it without grumbling and with a smile. And right away, I think of my sisters, uh, our kids' aunts, and they will say, hey, Mary Catherine, will you help me with this? Oh, sure, Annie Martha, I'd love to help you. Oh, Mary, um, Ariana, could you please go out and get, oh, sure, Aunt Laura, I'd love to. And it's like, wow, they're so respectful and polite. I actually feel a little jealous because why is it when I ask them to do stuff, there's not this like <laughs> quick to respond with joy, with ease. It's like, oh, mom, I already brought in two bags. Can't you ask somebody else? I took my shoes off. Or, But I love to see them show up in, when they're with other adults and they actually are quick to serve and respectful. And I know that's the kid that I, 
that they are. It's just in the home, it just kind of crumbles. <laughs> it falls, it, falls to the wayside. There is a mystery to that. Yeah. And I, again, I don't know if it's just that uh, they feel more relaxed and, and they don't have to be on their A game, right? They don't have to live up to their highest ideals. But it's something that, um, you know, giving them space to be themselves, <laughs> we should also challenge them not to settle for less. Yeah. All right, Carrie, do we have time for one last one? Uh, if you come across a parent or teacher working on something, ask if they can help, especially when we're like in the classroom or at another person's home. Hey, how can I help with that? Do you need any help? Can I serve something? Do you want me to open something? It's just a great way to, before they get to that event, say, hey, be helpful, serve. This is our call to love others, put others before ourselves. Well, thank you for opening that up for us, Carrie. I'm very sure. grateful to you for all of those uh, all those things. I'm trying to show good manners as we end the program <laughs> today. Once again, we do encourage you to come by currentcrew.tv, leave us a message, tell your friends, share this podcast, and check out many more free resources that we have available for you on currentcrew.tv. Thanks so much for listening.